Um, the film was a, a quick eight minute journey through the headlights in terms of sector led improvement in the West Midlands. Um, I think the key exam question that we all face when the regulatory framework ceased, um, and in fact, this goes all the way back to Peter Hayes presidency when we started on the sector led journey, is can the sector be trusted to effectively judge itself? Um, now that is an exam question that will continue to be posed whatever form and methodology we use going forwards. But what we've tried to do as we've gone is continually evolve. And if the last 14 months isn't an example of why you need to adapt what you're doing, I can't think of anything else that would be. So we did a couple of years back introduce at the start of the process uh, case file auditing so that uh, we would have principal social workers from across the region coming and looking at practice, forming judgments about uh, individual assessments, and then using that to form key lines of inquiry. Uh, we have recently moved on to a confirm uh, and challenge approach that's designed to support councils through the COVID pandemic, to help them start thinking about recovery, to help them start thinking about relationships across the system, resilience in the care sector and with the voluntary sector and particularly start thinking through some of the issues that carers have been facing uh, through the lockdown period. Um, we have also introduced experts by experience which is why uh, Mr Mansell is here with us today to talk through uh, later on the, the contribution that he made to bringing his perspective. So it is a methodology that is constantly evolving now uh, we are looking at the dial moving back towards a more regulatory approach. What we wanted to do in getting the University of Birmingham to look at the work that we've been doing across the region. Uh, and indeed, we've got five further challenges that are penciled in this year was to give us that objective view and try to start answering that exam question of is this robust? Is this objective enough? Does it lead to tangible change? Is it sufficiently challenged? Uh, challenging in approach um, and I think just before I hand over to Professor Robin Miller to talk through uh, the key findings from the work that they're doing the key benefit of all of this from my perspective is that you've got people who understand the context for local government you've got people who understand what it is to experience uh, the services that, that we offer and that we commission and you've also got a, a political read here so by triangulating those three strands alongside looking at frontline practice, all of those things come together to give a much quicker and frankly much cheaper view than other sources uh, of independent view may do. Now I'm hearing promises in the chat that we have a video that's about to work. So this is either going to be fourth time lucky or it's going to be a spectacular pie in the face. Uh, but Robin, if you can hold fire for a minute, we'll just see if we can get that clip to now work. Can I just say, I've just, I've just done a minute. Can you hear me? Can I just say, can you hear me, Matt? Yes, I can hear you, John. I, I've just had a message from Clinton Farkerson saying that he's, he's been, he's been waiting, waiting for ages to be logged, let in, and he's not been let in. Okay, we'll take a look at that. Let's just see if we can get the video up and running. Okay. Okay. Within the white paper, it's clear that a new uh, regulation framework will be introduced for social care. It is likely to contain information about market risks and also issues around how cost runs from local authority to providers and to the workforce. As a region, we've already put some work into thinking about uh, how we might prepare and develop our approach. We think our data hub and networks and peer challenge experience puts us in a good position. We think there is much, much for CQC and DHSE to, to learn from about how we self-manage, how we drive sector-led improvement in the region that they can use and draw from to develop their national approach. West Midlands ADAS has an active programme of peer challenge, so every local authority undergoes a peer challenge once every three years. Uh, we explore the, the full range of issues relevant to adult social care. 
I think we've gone through something like three cycles of each of the four, 14 local authorities. A team will come in led by a really experienced director who oversees the coordination, the actual peer review process. They will then gather a team of people around, including lead politicians, uh, experts by experience who are users of and carers of people who use services, and um, other senior managers and, and, and leaders within systems. And I think because it's people you know, but also people that have different experiences than you and good credibility, and um, you take a lot of cognizance of that. People who've got lived experience are much more able, much more intensely, acutely aware of what are the things that go wrong? What are the things I would want to know if I was going to be a recipient of care in the system? And they ask the most poignant questions. And we use those really in a very kind of powerful feedback way. We use quotations from people. So it's it's very direct experience that gets um, fed back. It gets shared initially with the council. The council will use that in a wide range of engagement and stakeholder forums with politicians, with staff, with stakeholders, with members of the public. Um, but we then as a group of directors of social care will also share the learning of that. So it's really powerful because it's about taking the things that we know evidence-based practice shows are having good outcomes for uh, the citizens of those areas. And we share and learn from that and also build on the things that, that haven't gone quite so well. The networks have been a key feature of the improvement programme for a number of years. Uh, those networks include external partners, people like Skills for Care, University of Birmingham. We also engage extensively with NHS partners in the region and partners from public health um, and Department of Health and Social Care, really to make sure that we've got that focus on strategic issues um, at a system level. We have a very active regional commissioning network. Lead commissioners share good practice in terms of quality and costs. Uh, and that gives us a really good insight about what's happening over the region. Uh, it's really helpful as an individual local authority to understand where you are in the pack, whether we're paying too much or not enough. It helps us to understand where we are quality wise in terms of the proportion of providers rated good or excellent by the CQC. Uh, and I think over the last few years, uh, that comparative benchmarking has enabled us to uh, drive up quality uh, and get more cost effective. The way we use our resources network in the region really, really forces us to ask some hard questions of ourselves and each other about what we're doing with the money, how we're using it to support people, the outcomes it delivers in a way that we wouldn't be able to do if we weren't so well organised through West Midlands ADAS. The networks that we have through ADAS and the, the professional reports and the, the sharing of information that we have is really important in making sure we understand have we got a particular gap in a certain part of the profession? We undertake lots of lobbying and engagement with our national and, and, and regional colleagues, particularly in the NHS, to demonstrate the productivity and the financial gain of having a sustainable workforce. This is a shared web-based resource. The intention is that we use that data to get a really rich picture of what's going on in the West Midlands. That data does exist publicly, um, of course. However, it's spread across lots and lots of different locations and can be, frankly, a real pain, actually, to find. The data is really important for us. So it provides in one place a number of key metrics around social care activity and performance. It gives a really quick view about how we're performing, what areas of weakness we might have, and importantly, which areas might be doing better than Coventry which can then lead to a phone call or conversations about what they're doing. It's really useful to spot any trends as they emerge, which means we can intervene and act earlier. In relation to the care market, we can see what risks might be starting to emerge in providers, staff turnover and vacancies, again, as a key indicator of risk. Data about uh, hospital admissions and discharges, uh, being able to compare how we're doing on those discharge pathways uh, which are both important to people, but also uh, politically pretty hot potatoes. And, and then we've got some of the pandemic related important metrics that will put us in good, that should put us in a good place to deal with whatever the future of regulation looks like for social care.
think one of the things the West Midlands has done is to take sector-led improvement seriously, introducing a regional programme of peer review. It's not just the process of being, if you like, looked at by a peer review. It's also the process as a member of the team yourself, looking at another council. Actually, your own learning of being involved in going somewhere else, talking to other people, thinking, oh, I like that, I'll borrow that, I'll use that. So it's a shared basis for that. Um, And also, I think an important element of that uh, was to introduce um, actually looking at the recording uh, and the experience of people who were receiving care. How is all of the ambition of the authority being translated into work with the lives of people? Ultimately, this is all about the knowledge and experience that people have of living in communities and choosing to live the life they want to lead. Um, And I think the real progress is about really hearing and understanding that experience. So for all the data, all the research, it's also about voice. Um, And I think also what I've seen is a big shift towards thinking local uh, and beginning to really understand the complexities of living communities and how sometimes it requires the gentlest of interventions and support to allow communities to flourish. I think it's really important that the restart of external Uh, validation of performance isn't a sort of Miss Havisham moment and freeze the clock because as I said I think that that external offer should always build on a really strong sense of self-improvement. Knowing yourself and knowing your own journey of improvement is should always be stronger than that that can always be found by an external view. It's always helpful to have a fresh pair of eyes. External validation can add something to it but it should always build upon that sense of your own journey and your own improvement. Okay, well done, Precious, for managing to get it to work. Welcome, Mr. Farkerson. Apologies that you got held up on the way there. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, no, no less than the the president-elect himself in the room. So over to you, Robin, if you could go through the findings of the research, that'd be excellent. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Good. And hopefully you can all hear me OK. So my name is Robin Miller. I'm Professor of Collaborative Learning at the University of Birmingham. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the research team, which includes my colleagues uh, Sharanya Makesh from the Department of Social Work and Social Care and Jason Lowther from the Institute of Local Government Studies. Uh, and I'll be talking about the recent um, evaluation we've done of the peer challenge process uh, within the West Midlands uh, region. Uh, and as a university, we were very keen to, to undertake this work, uh, partly because it's a very important endeavour for ADAS and a local practice community. Uh, and we are very committed to doing research that's useful um, to what the current and future practice is. It's also a very under-researched approach, and uh, despite the fact that sector-led improvement has been so uh, important to, to local government in general and adult social care in particular, uh, when we undertook a, a evidence review, we could only find 12 peer-reviewed papers uh, alongside grey literature. Um, which highlights really how uh, under-researched it is. And and that's true in in healthcare as well. We've done some work around um, special measures in hospitals where peer improvement was uh, part of that programme. But again, it's it's not been well studied. And finally, we think there's an area for for, for considerable further research, both in comparison to other improvement or assurance approaches, such as consultancy and national inspections, and also in relation to other peer review processes. Because as we know, it's often not so much what you do, but how you do it. Uh, in terms of the study, and um, we'll produce some um, slides that will be shared um, after today, and the report will be available by the end of May. Uh, we undertook a literature review. We undertook um, interviews with key um, participants uh, from different stakeholder groups, and we undertook a survey as well. So we're going to draw on all those findings in terms of what we're going to share today. So there's two two main elements we we uh, want to look uh, upon. First of all, was what's the value? You know, what are the benefits of doing this peer challenge process, uh, which is so embedded uh, in the West Midlands adult social care uh, approach? Um, and in terms of our research, we found that 78% of people, so the vast majority of people, thought the peer challenge was extremely or very useful uh, to improving adult social care in their local authorities. 
Uh, and a similar statistic, which I think is interesting, is 92.5% of people thought it was a good use of resources, uh, which I think, again, uh, highlights that people feel that it's, it's a very effective way um, in terms of trying to understand what's going well and what can be improved in adult social care. Um, and we asked them to compare uh, the peer challenge process in relation to other improvement approaches. And it was generally rated much better or somewhat better than inspection and consultancy. Um, and 88% of people said they would definitely recommend the peer challenge process to colleagues in other regions as a way of improving adult social care. So what were some of the benefits that people identified? Well, the first thing is they said that um, rather than just take a kind of headline view of key metrics, it went much, much deeper. It looked into the culture of their organisations. It looked into the key dynamics between different parts of the local authority and the local authority and external stakeholders in particular communities. And it tried to look at the leadership and gave them important um, insights into how the organisation was being led uh, and overseen. It was also a, been a regular opportunity for the local authority to stand back and to reflect upon what, what are we doing well, you know, what are we finding challenging, and how are we progressing uh, with our strategic plans. And all of us recognise that's an important part of what we do day to day, but unless we've got a, a structured approach to doing that, it's very often for that, very easy for that to slip off the agenda. Interestingly, didn't say that the, the peer challenge uh, would always say something new, that actually sometimes what was really helpful was it confirmed some of their um, uh, suspicions, uh, their assumptions about what wasn't going so well and perhaps what they could change. <clears throat> they also often added some important nuance to that. So people would have a partial picture, but actually the peer challenge process added some very important detail and some very important context to that. Um, and it also supported in terms of some of the initial um, thoughts of a, of a DAS or principal social worker, it sometimes confirmed those and therefore that was helpful in terms of speaking to the wider local authority and saying, look, it's not just us saying this, but actually some trusted external partners are also confirming that view. Um, and, and what was an often a result of the, the peer challenge process was it would then lead to either a new or revised action plans by the DAS or the principal social worker. And alongside the benefits for the recipient authority, um, what we heard time and time again was there was huge benefits for the people who were involved in the reviewing team. Uh, and the reviewing team had people with lived experience, they obviously had uh, an experienced director of adult social services, had principal social workers, and very importantly, I think this process is it had elected members um, from other authorities. And some of the highlights that um, people shared in terms of benefits for the reviewing team were, first of all, they could learn from the recipient authority. So uh, whilst each local authority is different, there are a number of similar challenges uh, that they're facing. And actually going into another authority, having the, the time uh, and the access to find out what they've been doing in terms of some of these shared challenges, um, often led to then the reviewing team taking back those ideas and building upon them in terms of what they were doing in, in their authority. Sometimes for the reviewing team, it confirmed that actually what they were doing was quite good. Uh, and that was that was reassuring that actually the track, the track they were on uh, was a good one to follow. Um, and it was particularly beneficial, I think, in many ways, the elected members. Uh, and if we try and think about people who take on the elected member roles, often, first of all, it can be people who don't necessarily come from an adult social care background per se. So this is a really good opportunity to meet colleagues within the review team and to spend time going in depth with another authority. Um, it can also help the elected members to connect up with, with colleagues who do similar um, portfolio briefs and other local authorities, uh, which they saw as being very helpful. For principal social workers, there was an opportunity to engage at a more of a strategic level uh, in terms of their, their uh, work. And for, and for people live, with lived experience, it, it really helped them to feel valued, that they were part of this quite illustrious review team uh, and they were being listened to by very senior members of the recipient local authority, which they saw as um, giving them sort of individual confidence, but also in terms of confirming the importance of their views. And, and the reason people said that the, the process did work well was because the way that ADAS, uh, working with the, the member local authorities in the West Midlands, had set it up. And, and there's got to be a, a acknowledgement to the work of Helen Coombs in this regard, who, who's really led a, a lot of the process. Um, and they both facilitated the individual reviews, 
Um, they provided uh, training, which was seen as very valuable to the reviewing team members, and also provided um, helpful tips, advice and guidance um, to both the recipient authority and to the review teams. And that led to over 90% of people feeling that they were individually well prepared uh, or better to either receive or to, to lead a review. Um, and a similar number to, who reported that actually the recipient local authorities were very well um, prepared in, in terms of the review process. As one would expect, uh, some of the issues that came up in terms of the process were just the, the logistics, the practicalities of engaging these different stakeholders, um, of, of making sure they got a, a robust timetable in place and that they got the necessary resources to administrate and to support um, the review team. And the review team and the fact this was interdisciplinary was seen as absolutely central. Um, so uh, to, to have that view of the, the review DASES, the, the practice view of the principal social workers, lived experience and elected members bringing a political perspective was seen as being absolutely key. Um, and the, the skill um, of the person who was leading that team was an important enabler to delivering um, in practice. Um, and the practice review, which you heard about um, on, on the film, which was a, a, something that's grown in strength um, as the peer challenge process has been developed in West Midlands, was a really important element. And, and, and within that, you've got two external principal social workers sitting with the host principal social worker to look at strength-based practice um, um, in that local authority, and also the practice conditions that we know are vital to foster um, the delivery of strength-based practice. Uh, and the practice review team look at case records, they speak to senior leaders, but they also crucially speak to team managers and social workers. And the insights from that practice review are, are very important and um, insight for the peer challenge as a whole. So what we found was, uh, uh, um, in summary, was a very positive experience uh, and something that people saw was, was generally beneficial um, and uh, provided a good value for money. But it wasn't perfect and, and nothing is perfect. Uh, and two, two of the areas that came up in particular um, uh, that could be improved, um, uh, and, and West Midlands ADAS are, 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 are you know, responding to this very seriously, is first of all, it was great to people with lived experience as part of the review team but there's an opportunity to do that better. And, and some of the comments we did get back from people with lived experience was at times they were unsure of the boundaries. What was it? What were they allowed to comment on? Uh, and what was outside what was expected of them? Uh, and also at times, perhaps a lack of confidence that they perhaps had the skills and expertise uh, in order to, to meet that expectation. There were still some examples of people using jargon or assuming um, an underpinning knowledge that, that they perhaps did not have. Um, and as I said earlier, the way the review team was run was absolutely crucial to them feeling that they could contribute um, and participate as fully as they would like. Um, and in terms of others and, and other people's views of people's lived experience, it was a similar thing. And actually one of the things that came up was perhaps more training for the, the other members of the review team in terms of meaningful involvement of people with lived experience. And again, this is quite typical, I think. It's, it's a major step forward, an important step forward for us to have people with lived experience as a central part of these process, but we need to understand how we can do better uh, and to build upon the support we provide them. Um, and the other major um, area for improvement, I think, was, was the, the extent to which the learning from each individual peer review or peer challenge process was shared with the wider region. Uh, and what we found was a pretty consistent message that 50% agreed there was a, a wider learning for the region, but 45% of people were unsure. And I think the unsure bit is just they weren't unsure about how that relates to the practice in other organisations. And similarly, but similar numbers were unsure if it actually had been shared in practice. Um, and there has been some processes put in place in terms of the principal social worker network in the region, in terms of some annual events, particularly in the early days of peer challenge to share the lessons. But I think it did highlight that that's an area that we could do more on in the region uh, in terms of making sure we get the most value that we can from the peer evaluation process. <clears throat> so in summary, I, I think we can, I think it's fair to say this is a, a well-established process that is uh, um, providing an important contribution to improving uh, adult social care in the region. Um, and I think there's some implications that can be taken forward in terms of the current national review um, for insurance and improvement. The first thing is that the nature of the process enables it to be challenging. You know, people said they were genuinely challenged uh, and it wasn't always a comfortable um, experience. 
but it was also a supportive one. Um, and recipient authorities said that they felt very able to be open about what they were doing as well as what they weren't doing so well um, uh, as part of the process. Um, the, the the issue about um, the the kind of practice reviews um, and the, the social work uh, the principal social workers being involved in that suggests that perhaps we could do more than just look at principal social work uh, roles in that. We could also look at a wider professional group such as occupational therapy. Um, the regional focus of the peer challenge process has been important because it's helped to build local networks in the region. Um, uh, and it's also meant that the reviews are contextually relevant. So yes, each local authority in the West Midlands is different, but there's also a, a commonality between them, and that's been important. West Midlands ADAS um, has provided, I think, effective leadership and coordination, and it's also just championed um, the importance of this process with uh, new DASES and new elected members when they've come in, um, and that's always important to do. And finally, this point about lived experience, it was valued by all, it was seen as an important contribution, but equally there's more to do to understand what, what is required to enable people to feel confident and supported in contributing as much as they could do um, to undertaking these review processes. So hopefully that gives you a kind of a, a rough kind of insight or a quick insight into what we found um, in terms of the uh, research. And we will be sharing a set of, a, a, a more detailed PowerPoint um, and indeed the report by the end of May. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a panel discussion and we're going to start off with um, stakeholders from the region uh, who've been involved um, in the peer challenge process, just responding to the findings of the research. So we did send it out to them earlier so they could get time to, to think about um, uh, how they want to respond to this. So um, for that, we've got uh, we've got Matt Boucher, we've got Paulette Hamilton, uh, we've got Richard Harling, and we've also got John Mansell, um, who's one of our contributors with lived experience. So John, do you want to just um, say hello? Because you've not uh, met the rest of the, the panel yet today. Hello, I'll just say with it. Great. And do you want to give a bit, bit of your background, John? You've gone on mute. OK, that's good. Good. It's always delays on the screen. Yeah. Hello, uh, uh, my name's uh, John Mansell. I'm also known as ex -booze Hound. Um I'm a mentally ill, retired alcoholic. Um, and since I had my mental breakdown in 2013, I've done as much as I can possibly locally and, and more widely to help other people um, air their views and experiences with mental illness and addiction. Uh, I might as well get it in there. I'm also an author as well, so I have a book out there available. Um, I was very fortunate and I was I was very uh honored to be uh asked to take part in the peer review um and i think at the time it, and it was said that matt, matt bowsher had taken a gamble uh in in asking me to to be part of it i was described as a guinea pig um as as i was the first person to uh, be a expert by experience or as I prefer to call a life experience warrior um, and I have to admit initially I, I was I was quite nervous uh, about the whole situation having said that listening to what Robin just said with regard to there were things that could be done better or done more deeply with lived experience or experience expert by experience one of the things he said was uh about being unsure of boundaries and and if i'm entirely honest i was never bothered by the boundaries i wasn't unsure of them i wasn't bothered by them and the reason i wasn't bothered by them is because we i'm there to be who i am i'm not there to i'm not there to be uh well behaved member of of of, of uh, you know the 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 establishment i'm there to um be me and and i think that's it, looking at the going further forward with the lived experience people that to me would be a message to get into their minds that they they've been asked to be part of it 
for a reason and the reason will be some stuff that they've done before the reason will be you know that the the people around like matt bowsher and and, and other people uh, respect their point of view and they're there and if there is a lack of confidence just to remember that they're there to be who they are um because that's all you can be i you know, it, it, it was great to see the process and I thought it was really worthwhile and, you know, quite eye, eye opening. Um, but it was really important that I was just me and and and, and nothing else. And um, I I definitely thought it was a, a well, well worked um, set up and I was really proud to be part of it. Great, thanks, Joe. That's that's great. That's great to hear. It was such a positive experience for you. Um, thank you. So, Paulette, do you want to come in next? So, in terms of the uh, the research, did it did it mirror your experiences? Was there things that surprised you, or, or things that you expected to see uh, included within it? I've got to be honest, Robin. I've known you for a long time, and no, the research didn't surprise me. This method has helped people like myself. Why is Clinton laughing? <laughs> Sorry, um, I know Clinton really well. Um, this research, um, for people like myself, who, when I first came in, for those who don't know me, I started my life as a nurse and had no understanding of social care. So I had the pleasure of doing my first peer challenge with um, Ellen and Peter A when he was in Birmingham and it was daunting I'll say that it, uh, it was absolutely daunting but I learned so much from that challenge that it, it's built on from there and what has happened now with the networks that have now been set up and I'm chairing one of the networks what we've been able to do with what you've done, Robin, we've been able to, um, as elected members, been able to really add value to what's going on. So it's really helped us as elected members to know what we're looking for, to know how to work with senior officers that perhaps we don't know, um, how the questions to ask when we get into a peer challenge. But the thing I learned from when I did it with Peter A many years ago, Peter was so diplomatic with how he fed back because some authorities, you have to be really careful. It's not that they don't want to hear. We're all a big family, but it's how you actually feed back. So over the years, I have really learned how to hit that message in a way that people grow from it. So can I say, Robin, nothing you've said in the report surprises me, but you know what's good? It's in one place. So we can now use it as a learning tool going forward. So I think well done and an excellent piece of work. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Paulette. And I would confirm nobody gives a harder message in a nicer way than you. <laughs> um, Matt, so what, what, what was the so what, there's two two main things we saw for improvement. One was the the experience, the people's lived experience. So one was the the sharing of learning around the region. So maybe do you want to have a reflection on that? Was that was that sort of disappointment, or was that something you expected to us to find? Um, I think it's fair. Firstly, I think um, I think the barriers in terms of uh, getting involved are much more significant if you're the person with lived experience, and I think. You know, there's uh, a job to do there to build confidence, to make sure that we've got more training opportunities available, as you've suggested. Um, I think we've got to think about how we adapt uh, the methodology a bit to make certainly some of the information uh, more accessible than it is. And acronyms would be chief amongst that in terms of uh, crimes committed by officers. Um, but I, I welcome that. I think we, we need to scale it up. And we also need to think about the role of health watches locally so that we've got that network of network things. So wherever possible, you've got as broad a range of uh, local voices that you can tap into as possible. Um, secondly, uh, there's a point There's one of your recommendations is about um, the depth, the level of depth that the challenges go into and also making sure that the scope is sufficiently broad and I think as a region we need to put maximum time and effort into getting the scope right in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, as a host director, might have a list of things I'd love you to see, but chances are they're going to be a bit shiny. They're going to be at the more impressive and better performing end of the spectrum. So I think we we need to be really um, transparent and challenge ourselves uh, to be a bit more warts and all, perhaps. Um, and I think the point made about benchmarking is equally fair. There's, there's got to be comparability, not standardization, but that does have to be a meaningful uh, means to be able to compare. Um, and then finally, I think the point about learning is particularly interesting given COVID. So uh, the clock starts ticking the minute that the challenge is concluded and the currency of those recommendations, which by the way, could do with being more specific and a bit more challenging in some instances, um, doesn't last very long. So if we are gonna le leave a benefit across the region, we need to move fast and we need to communicate effectively. Um, but I do think in terms of the positives, we tend to get the right people with the right skill set and the right expertise on the right challenges. And that's one of the benefits of, of the peer kind of approach. So I, I think it's fair. I think it's balanced. And I can see plenty of opportunities to take positive steps forward to make this more robust. Thanks, Matt. That's really helpful. And I should say to the audience in general, if you've got any queries or questions or comments, just write them in the chat and we'll share that with the panel. Um, Richard, Richard Harling, what do you think the lessons are um, from the, the, the peer challenge process and the research to date that should be thought about in terms of the national review? Um, so I, I think the first thing is this point about culture, uh, and that's a point that ADAS has been trying to make through the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, the right culture is one that seeks to reflect and learn and improve uh, rather than judge and punish. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't be challenging, but it does mean that local authorities can be open and honesting, honest about their strengths and their shortcom shortcomings. Uh, everybody does something well, nobody does everything well, uh, and we should all be looking to continually improve in everything we do. Uh, I think the second thing is that uh, there's a number of components to our peer challenge program. So using data, self-assessment, uh, the actual peer challenge meetings themselves, uh, and they are consistent with the emerging ADAS view about how adult social care assurance ought to work. So I think that does give us uh, quite a strong foundation to build on. OK, thanks, Richard. That's really helpful. And and John, a similar a similar question to you then. So we're we're having this national review of of quality improvement and and assurance, building on your your kind of experiences in in and undertaking the the review in Dudley. What would what would you say you would what would you say to the kind of national review team then that needs to be the the, the lessons that you would share with them? Um, that's a good one, really. Uh, I think uh, can you? I, I'm, I am unmuted, aren't I? Yeah, loud yeah, and yeah. clear. Um, I think for me, um, the the it's important that we get more people like myself involved in that process, um, and 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 partly the reason being is is I think people like myself um, uh, from outside the system, we are we're not as tied back as the people within the system obviously they have to be aware of the politics they have to be aware of of certain things and they have to be be and they're aware of what they can and can't sort of pick into whereas i think sort of with 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 and although matt, matt said earlier you know with regard to all the acronyms and all these sort of things I did a little vlog after after I did or took part in the peer peer review, and I, I stated within that that you know quite a lot of the time I I didn't really know exactly what was going on because I didn't know the different apartment departments and I didn't know the you know the hierarchy and the and the and the and the, and the things, but that didn't matter because I think for me the 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 most important thing in anything like this, whether it be NHS, whether it be adult social care is the is the whether it be the patient or the people that are 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 giving the services it's got to be about the people and if the people aren't right 
then it doesn't matter what system they're in, it's not it's not going to work. So I think what, what someone like myself or other lived experience people brings to it is <laughs> it's not it, I'm not saying that all you guys are inhuman, but it brings a, it, it brings more of a human um, aspect to it. And 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 I think it's I think it's really important that that, that is taken forward. Um, that that and and that allows us to 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 know that we're making a difference so i've been in lots of different situations where they talk about you know co-production and and listening to the 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 their users and things like that well they talk about it a lot but not very many many organizations actually seem to put the money where their mouth is Whereas I saw what I saw with with Dudley, uh, Matt Bausch taking the risk and asking me in, and what I saw with West Midlands ADAS working with Helen and and Pete, is that they were willing to listen, they were willing to ask my ask what they wanted of me, but also they were willing to try and implement things, and look at things from a different point of view. Uh, and and since doing the peer review, I I have been included in in a number of conversations, and and so moving forward, I think ADAS as a as a as a general rule, they will get an awful lot from making sure that every peer review challenge has some lived experience on 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 that peer review because we bring a different aspect we bring a different angle um and you know it, it's uh it, it's really important and and also i think hopefully what i've tried to do as well and i will do later is 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 say this you know on twitter and things like that that you know you guys are listening to what i'm saying uh, and you, you guys are interested in my point of view as well, and 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 it's not. I'm not just there as a token. Um, it, it works, and it and it really does. And and uh, hopefully that answers the question. It does, Neil. Thanks, John. And I think it's ironic that that for some of the people who lived experience, almost they felt the couldn't contribute or they couldn't be taken seriously because they didn't know the language and, and the acronyms. But actually, other people said, well, the fact that they don't know these acronyms and they just tell it straight and they tell it as they see it was actually one of the most powerful contributions they made. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. And I think I said you in the conversation with, with your, your researchers were, and they asked me how much preparation did I put into it. Um, I had to be honest and I said I decided not to put too much preparation into it because I didn't want to um, preempt what I was going to find. Um, you know, I'm never, you know, I, as an outsider, I'm never going to understand the full workings of adult social care. So why try? Just go there and be who you are and, and respond you know, they do say it's fail. Was it uh, prepare to no? Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I prefer to wing it, um, and uh, I think it works better that way because it's uh, uh, it's more honest. Um, hopefully, that answers that question. It does. Still. Thanks, John. That's right. The, the, that's right. The, the, the benefits of winging it. I think that's what you were saying there. So, well, that's um, Matt, do you want to respond to the uh, the question that, that Carol said, which is very, very interesting about financial viability? Yes. Yeah, so, so, Carol, I'm going to describe this as a Columbo question. So thank you very much for raising it. Uh, so the question, just so uh, everybody is aware, we know the Secretary of State will be empowered to intervene if a council's found to be failing in its duties. And the focus today from government in determining intervention seems to be on safety and dignity, financial viability, and a council's ability to improve at the pace needed. Any reflections on the viability issue from your experience of peer reviews? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think um, you've got to bear in mind now that for about 11 successive financial years, with the exception of things like the recent COVID related grants and the Better Care Fund, uh, the net resourcing um, for local government and adult social care is circa 40% of the, the typical uh, share of a council's budget, uh, has 
not increased in line with demand or in real terms and in most areas has in fact decreased. So um, I think that any central focus needs to have a robust methodology for understanding firstly sufficiency of resource. We know that the thorny issue of long term reform has been punted down uh, the line through successive governments on both sides. So I can say that during PERDA. Um, and that the recent white paper doesn't really answer any of those questions. So I, I think when you look at those councils who have been uh, very close to municipal bankruptcy, the starting question has to be, is there actually enough resource in the system to do the job properly? And, and I'm yet to see a methodology that has been adopted across the board that answers that question. Um, I think there are then beneath that a whole raft of perfectly sensible questions that you can ask about use of resources that some of the benchmarking data that our finance network regularly looks at. Um, it is fair and I think you don't just look at unit costs, you look at staffing infrastructure, but you also look at processes and pathways um, and you look at self-directed support, you look at direct payments and what you try and do is form a, a judgment about whether or not the resources that do exist are being used proportionately, are being used in a person-centred way, uh, enable quality in terms of care and support, um, and whether or not there are any obvious consequences that can be, or conclusions that can be reached about doing better with, with that cash. But the headline message has to be set in that context. So if you're going to come and judge a service that's had demand up year on year for the last 11 years and resource down, do not be surprised uh, if you, you do see issues that, that link to resourcing and the entirety of your conclusion should not purely be about that framework that is not set by local government, it is set centrally and it's reflected in terms of, of, of the policy on the day. Thanks, Matt. That's really helpful. Paulette, have you got a, you, you obviously have a, a great overview of, of resources in, in Birmingham City Council. It, it, have you got any perspective to, to share on that financial viability issue? Just, just quickly, um, as we're in Perda, I've got to not be political, yeah. but as a as a cabinet member and as somebody that chairs the Health and Wellbeing Board, there just isn't enough money in the system. In Birmingham, we've been unique through a lot of the work, the changes in practice, through using three conversations, really moving towards a preventative type model, using neighborhood networks. We've been able to save money over the last few years, but that won't go on because many of the people that we've managed to keep out of the service for a number of years, as time goes on, it doesn't mean they're not going to come into the service. It just means they're coming into the service further down the line. So I've been a great advocate and what I've been saying and, and asking of the government, we need to look at a, a, a funding spending review around social care. But we also need to look at how will social care be run in the future. And this is where I think the peer challenges are so important because there are a number of different things that are going on in authorities that sometimes they're not really publicised. And when you go in and you see what's happening and you see what the experts um, that are in place are saying, and this thing about the, the place model and working in the place direction how do you move money from the health service so you're working with ICSs there's so many questions up in the air but for me the fundamental question is and I have to agree with Matt there isn't enough money in the system but a lot of the system is so disjointed that at the moment we seem to be the recipients of the money that we just pay out the other end. So for me, I need to see a fundamental overall of adult social care so we can see a long term future that's sustainable going it well in the 21st century. And at the moment, I have to agree Better Care Fund's been keeping us going. Even some of the joint work we've been doing with the NHS, it's using Better Care Fund money. Many organisations will tell you with the Better Care Fund money, if you put a million in, you expect to get a million out. You know, so it's very much they're, they're working to the budgets that they've actually put in there. So it does need to change a lot. As a system leader, 
it hasn't been easy over the last six years, but we've had to really tighten our belts. We've gone from a position of, I think it was 13% on direct payments to nearly 40% on direct payments. So we had to really look at how we manage care and services within Birmingham. But for me, the big, the long-term issue is how are we working with the NHS to look at that prevention piece? And this is where the ICS and working at a system level where we don't duplicate is going to be so important. And, and, that is, and that is a fantastic end note. Thank you so much to the panel, to Matt, to John and Paulette for providing such an, an informative uh, discussion on, on the research on the peer evaluation process. And it's just over to Richard then for some final words from the West Midlands. Uh, thank you, Robin. Um, so and I, I hope it's come across that in the West Midlands, uh, we believe we've got a strong foundation of peer challenge that we can build on. Uh, as adult social care assurance develops nationally. Uh, in the spirit of continual improvement, we've asked Robin and colleagues to review the programme. Uh, we are very grateful, Robin, for your insights, which we will use to refine and enhance the programme uh, over the coming year. And we hope that our experience is helpful for colleagues outside the region and very happy to share more details with anybody who is interested. Thank you. I think I don't. I'm not sure whether we're going to get kicked out, but um, I think Matt's got his hands up. I don't know if Matt wants to say a final word, and then we'll yeah. be closed down. Um, very quickly, then. Thank you all for your time and, and for uh, joining in. We didn't get as much time for questions as we'd hoped because of the technical issues. So I'll pop contact details in the chat if anybody's got anything they want to raise. And, and thanks to all my colleagues for their contributions today as well.